Vincent Merda, uh, can I present you? Um, for those that don't know Vincent in this hall, not very many, but he's a senior lecturer and researcher in the Department of Cultural Studies at Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, and the Academy for Creative and Performing Arts in Leiden and The Hague. And also I have in the Dokakta's program in this building, in this room very often. And he studied double bass at the Conservatoire of Rotterdam and received his master both in musicology and in philosophy at Utrecht University. He wrote his dissertation on the relation between narrativity and contemporary music at Leiden University. Uh, he has published books and articles about musical narrativity, musical effect, improvisation and auditory culture and he is founding editor of the online Journal of Sonic Studies. His current research focuses on the relation between musical practices, interaction and creativity. Beside his academic activities, he is active as a double bassist in several jazz and improvisation ensembles as well as being a composer. So Vincent, you are more than welcome. Go ahead. Thank you, Paolo. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. Well, let's start off with listening to at least the beginning of a piece of music, and more specifically, an improvisation of one of the ensembles that I'm the bass player in, and the Molloy, consisting of keyboards and electronics, drums, and me on the other We'll just start listening to it, and afterwards we can discuss. So this was a beginning of a free improvisation, free in the sense that we didn't um, and, 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 uh, determine certain things or constraints beforehand, we just started playing. And by this time we started with playing a loop instigated by the keyboard player. And I think a lot of things that are happening in this improvisation are also relevant for performance in general. And the main point is that performance is a kind of an interaction. It is an interaction or an encounter between many different elements or phenomena. Of course, it is an encounter between sounds, not only sounds that my fellow musicians play, but also, at least as importantly, the kind of sounds that I myself make. Now, of course, I have certain ideas, certain conceptions as to, okay, this is what I intend to play. Yeah, but of course, <laughs> Many times the kind of sounds that I actually produce while playing do not completely conform to my mental imagination or idea or conception that I had beforehand. And therefore the confrontation or encounter that is happening during performance is also one between me, myself, my ideas, my preconceptions, my personal and musical tastes, and the actual sounds that I produce and kind of are projected back to me because of course I listen to the sounds that I play myself. 
Of course, it's also an encounter between the sounds the other musicians make. It is also an encounter between my body and the bodies of the other performers. Even my body with my own body. How do I feel at a certain moment? Does a certain phrase that I feel, does it feel pleasant or fine or whatever? Or do I want to change something just for, because of the mere fact that physically it doesn't feel right? Because, for instance, the instruments vibrate, vibrate a certain way in the whole that doesn't really conform to my preferred way of playing. It is an encounter between different ideas of the different musicians, especially when it concerns free improvisation. We have constantly have to deal with the musical ideas and musical information, so to speak, that the other performance throw at you almost literally. And so, performance is a continuous encounter. And I think that holds for all performance, and all musical performance in particular. And I think in musical improvisation, these kind of encounters are, you could say, exemplified or exaggerated or foregrounded. And of course, these, these interactions are, 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 not, are not negative interactions in the sense that they kind of inhibit your playing. Now, of course, if you play something and your fellow musician, so to speak, interferes with your musical ideas or introduces something that doesn't conform with the musical phrase or whatever that you were developing at a certain point in the improvisation, and that might be considered as kind of a negative thing, as kind of an infringement of your own musical autonomy. And you want to play something, you want to develop a certain idea, but your fellow musicians either don't understand what you're trying to do, or don't agree with what you're doing, and therefore introduce other musical material. You have to deal with that in one way or another. And you can, of course, interpret that in a negative sense, in the sense of, hey, I'm trying here to develop my ideas, and you guys are interfering with what I'm doing. Or, in a more positive sense, like, okay, hey, what he's doing, that's actually quite interesting, so let me try to somehow connect to that idea and come up with something else. Or let go of my initial musical idea and try to develop something else. And in doing so, and these, these constant infringements of other people's ideas and sounds and, 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 and musical or other kinds of behavior, infringe your own autonomy and they constantly force you to adapt to the musical situation as it evolves during Performance. And I think that a focus on these kinds of interactions that are happening during a performance may help us in trying to better understand what performance is or can be. And that is one of the things that I aim to do in this presentation. At first, I would like to explore the productivity of Deleuze's theory of ethics in the analysis of musical performance, and in this case, taking musical improvisation as a case study. And I'll try to argue that interaction is at the core of those encounters, uh, which we call performance. And that the Leusian ethics is able to articulate the specificity of the interaction that constitutes the performance. And then finally, if there's time, I will very tentatively propose that musical performance may also be able to teach us, us about interaction and the ethical aspects of it. So not only that ethics may inform us about performance, but performance may also inform us about how to behave in interactional um, situations. Okay, first I will focus more on the notion of performance as this disruptive encounter. An encounter in performance, either playing solo or playing with other people, it influences all actors, all characters, ideas, um, people, instruments, sounds that are involved in the uh, performance, so both human and non-human. And they can determine how this performance will continue. Now, of course, we as musicians kind of um, uh, um, think, or perhaps more accurately hope, that we are in control of what is happening on stage. But of course, in, in whichever kind of performance you've, you've been involved in, you. I think you have a similar experience and many times there are so many factors that are not really in your control but they have a huge influence on the way you perform at a certain moment, at a certain time, at a certain place. And so this encounter, the acoustics of the room for instance, and take for instance for example the presentation that I'm giving now, I'm influenced by the number of people sitting here, the way they stare at me or try to avoid staring at me, or that's also a possibility. The way the room sounds, the way I hear my own voice, and it all kind of disrupts with, let's say, my idea of an ideal presentation and how an ideal presentation should take place. And I already 
at this moment realize that, okay, my ideal presentation that will be happening here today for whichever texture may be at play here. And so we always need to adapt with this kind of dis disruption. But again, I would like to stress that these disruptions can also be interpreted in a positive sense. And that they're not only infringements of your autonomy as a presenter or a performer, but they can also help you and come up with new ideas, new avenues, new musical ideas, whatever. And so an encounter disrupt, but if disruption can be considered also a positive thing. Now, in order to uh, discuss these disruptions uh, in a bit more detail, I would like to play a second fragment of the same improvisation that I just played. And this second, second fragment was kind of a, a change of, let's say, mood. It started, it continued with the kind of loop sequence that the entire conversation started with. At a certain point, the loop was stopped by the, by the keyboard player because he was the one in control over the sampler in order to, to start and stop the loop and, and instigate other loops. And then you kind of could, could perhaps notice the kind of searching for a continuation of this improvisation. Of course, we could decide to stop here. Okay, it's a short improvisation based on this loop and it's kind of at least the suggestion of coherence, because the, the musical material is, in, is in varied in, in, to a large extent. Or we can, of course, try and come up with something else, and kind of it's searching at certain moments, like, okay, what kind of musical mood shall we um, instigate and continue with next? That is, that is something that you could notice here in this, in this fragment, especially when the, when the music kind of died down, you hear that the keyboard players start playing piano and try to come up with another mood in another tonality, which I kind of misinterpreted, hence the, uh, the, the out of tune note that I played at a certain moment, and which is also a kind of a disruption that happened at the time I played out of tune, and I kind of decided, okay, what shall I do? And I kind of did the easy way out and made a kind of a glissando, as if, as if, I, as if to, to indicate, oh, this out of tune note was, was intended. It's all part of the musical performance that we, that we are developing here at this moment. And so, again, kinds of, let's say, micro-disruptions, which at any one time can either completely, let's say, destroy and therefore end the performance, or help us continue. And, well, in this case, we try to continue when I started playing with the bow. <coughs> and so, again, these, all these encounters disrupt the autonomous development of ideas. Yeah, I would have liked to continue playing with the lute and, and come up with some other, some other musical ideas. But on the other hand, these disruptions may be creative because they help you to come up with other ideas that may um, uh, steer the, the, the performance in a different direction. Now, what does Deleuze have to do with all these kinds of um, uh, phenomena and moments that I've discussed thus far? Well, what I think is that you can um, conceptualize these disruptions in ethical terms. And for Gilles Deleuze, bodies and thoughts 
can be defined as capacities for affecting and being affected. So everything we hear, see, feel, do, experience, they all affect us, and in, and in return we can affect all these other things, either animate or inanimate. And in his famous book on uh, Spinoza, Deleuze says, and I quote, Ethics is the study of the relations of speed and slowness, of the capacities for affecting and being affected that characterizes each thing. And then he continues, these things can be anything. An animal, a body of sound, of course particularly interesting in the case of musical performance, a mind, or an idea. So everything we see here, do, feel, think, avoid, all have the capacity to affect us. And in turn, we have the capacity to affect all these other things, phenomena, people, and what have you. Yeah. Here at this moment, I am affecting you in a certain way, and you are all very definitely affecting me as well at this moment. Okay. So, okay, so if indeed everything has the capacity to affect us, <coughs> what does that mean then when it comes to, to ethics? Well, According to Deleuze, one should always strive for a maximization for the capacities or abilities to affect and be affected. And kind of, you could say, it's kind of a call for an openness, so not to close yourself off for experience, and especially unknown experience that perhaps you're not familiar with, but on the contrary, to open yourself up to all these kinds of periods and don't be afraid to be affected and also to affect yourself, other people's things, thoughts, ideas, minds, in whichever way. And so Deleuze kind of advocates um, a maximization of interaction, an openness, and a positive involvement with those interactions. Yeah, like he says in, in, the, in the same book on Spinoza, he says, the production of joy is a positive expansion of affective capacity, whereas what he calls sadness is a negative stagnation of feeling. <coughs> and when we take this and when we think again um, of the musical, um, the musical performance, the improvisation that I did, you can continuously see how we try to deal with affection and also the way we try to either shut ourselves up or open ourselves um, uh, for these kinds of affections. And do I listen to my other players? Or do I try to just kind of stubbornly continue my own idea and try to ignore the other players? Of course, trying to ignore the other players, that means that you're already very thoroughly affected by, by the things that they're doing because they incite you to, um, um, uh, to, to um, have this certain mindset in which you try to block the other players. And, and this kind of negotiation between, okay, what am I doing, what are the other players doing, and how shall I relate to what the other players is doing, and how can I contribute to the performance as a whole that we're developing at that moment, and, and, and how does that affect us, and how can I maximize that effect? So that's a kind of a continuous process that's happening in improvisation. And you could say that a bad improvisation, if there is such a thing, uh, is one in which the performers are indeed not sensitive to the affections of others and the affections that they themselves produce and kind of project upon others. And so, musical dimension, musical performance has an ethical dimension. And it's an act that on the one hand infringes the autonomy of performance and the instruments and sonic bodies, and because I cannot freely do whatever I want because the situatedness of my performance kind of forces certain restrictions upon me. And the performance also influences the capacities of these bodies, of my body, the body of my instrument, the sonic bodies that I produce, the ideas that I have to undergo joy. And especially when it comes to improvisation, these things become apparent. Uh, interaction incites affects, and affects incite interaction with all actors, human and otherwise. And improvisation, therefore, is a constant disruption through affection. You try to somehow affect, touch, reach your fellow musicians, your audience, or whatever, and in turn, you hope that they will do the same to you. And you try to literally play with this, let's say, ex exchange of affections. 
Then therefore, I would say that improvisation indeed is ethical because it concerns the potentiality of disruptive affections of all actors, human and non-human. Now I see I have a couple of minutes left, so let's just very briefly uh, see what this interpretation, this conception of performance might uh, uh, hold for our ideas about ethics in more general. And so if we think that performance might be some kind of elucidation, some kind of foregrounding, some kind of making explicit of these kinds of ethical encounters in which these effective disruptions are constantly at play, and we could say that musical performance, and perhaps musical improvisation in particular, can teach us about how to deal with these effective disruptions. How to, how to deal with them in such a way that affection is maximized, both with yourself as a performer or an actor in any other kind of situation, and also for the other people, things, ideas and situations that you're engaged with. So, how to deal with interactions in such a way that affection, so this positive expansion of feeling, is maximized for all actors involved. And I hope that I've kind of maximized the effective interaction in this presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Very interesting presentation, thank you so much. And we have time, we have actually almost 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I'm glad to open the floor. Um, I just had a question. Yes. I, it's interesting. I, I, I've also dealt with this topic, so it's interesting oh, to, yeah. by chance to, to see it come up here. Uh, I wrote this down. Uh, so my use of the concept of um, affect and performance and all these things with Deleuze and Spinoza has been to um, has been doing the subject. Mm -hmm. um, whereas your theory deals more with the, the performers themselves, as far as I understand. I think you came a little bit to that at the very end, um, to sort of opening it up to the to the rest of all the different actors going on. Um, and so my question was just, uh, what role does the production of joy or of a positive affectation in the listening subject play in your evaluation of the performance, or in your, your uh, ethical mm -hmm. uh, understanding of the performance? Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, no, I think it plays a hugely important role. I think, well, those of you who are performers have all had the experience that performance situation in which you feel that the audience is positively engaged in a certain way is fundamentally different from a performance in which the audience isn't. So if you indeed succeed in somehow affecting the listener in a certain positive way that immediately kind of returns and, and, and has an effect on you as a performer. And not necessarily because they start yelling and shouting or whatever, but I think we all, you, you'll, you'll know when an audience is engaged or attentive and appreciative of what you're doing without them explicitly saying so by means of yelling, clapping, or screaming. And so this kind of yeah, very subtle, effective interaction which mostly has to do with bodily posture, with, with other things, is extremely important. So if I as a performer succeed in positively affect a listener that immediately, um, I immediately, let's say, reap the rewards of that um, um, of that action because it is returned to me. So the listener and the way I affect a listener and the way a listener experiences the music and is either, <coughs> let's say, lured into the music and, 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 and focuses completely on the music is extremely important for the performer as well. So I think that that like, is very important in a, in a performance context, yes. We have the uh, Franz and then Kier. Yeah, thank you for the Sounding very beautiful the place and this <laughs> spacious uh, surrounding. Um, I missed one word in your presentation. Oh, you won? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm coming back to your dissertation of narrativity. Uh -huh. And I can very much uh, see that interactive encounters and disruption through affection, etc., are part of a story, of a narration. <coughs> and listening to the music, I clearly could think of a narrative mm -hmm. in that playing, not only of the band, but also the composition of the double bass. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see this relation of the narration, the narrativity, and what you said about uh, the losers, etc. Yeah. Et et well, well yeah, yeah, thank you for, for making that connection, because I, I think that's a, very, that's a very interesting one for those of you who don't know what 
how I conceptualize musical narrative, even musical narrativity is the representation of a temporal development. So in other words, a temporal development that we somehow experience while listening to, in this case, new music. That is my definition of musical narrative. I don't think we should go into detail again because that would take another hour. But and that's kind of in a nutshell what I think that a narrative is. And indeed for me, as a performer, in the performance, I consciously, I'm constantly trying to create narratives, if only because, let's say, the, the, the continuing arcs and the gestures that I'm trying to produce, they all kind of contribute to a larger musical story, of course, a musical story without um, a, a telling a literal story, just as we do in a verbal sense, but a, a story in the sense that you feel a, a sense of development, a sense of going somewhere, a sense of, it's a very important uh, element of narrative as well, and, 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 uh, uh, an alternation, an interplay between tension and resolution, and trying to create these moments of tension and resolution with other musicians in a, in a free improvisational setting is extremely important, at least for me, for, let's say, the possibility to maximize the affection of both ourselves and the audience, because I think if you succeed in convincing me, create these interplays of tension and resolution, I think you've come a long way to trying to affect, in a positive sense, the audience as well. So, Absolutely, extremely important, yes. And Kier? Um, I was wondering, uh, first of all, I love, I, love, I love your presentation, thank you very much, and the music too. Um, I was wondering how or if your model would take us into account cultural or, or historical specificity in, in that, uh, in, uh, for example, jazz and improvisation in America has a very you know, long history of um, you know, affecting audiences, but not necessarily uh, affecting the performers in the same way. And, you know, I'm thinking of instances like Free Jazz or the ACM Collective and, and the manner in which they actually just try to disrupt affect and communication mm -hmm. um, because of the sort of cultural and, and uh, historical and economic baggage yeah. that such means of communication carried with them. Mm -hmm. so. No, of course, <laughs> cultural specificity and cultural background, which, which I kind of kind of uh, summarized under the, under the number of, of situations is, 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 is very important. For instance, I, I, I explained by, uh, uh, while answering the, the previous questions about this notion and the interplay of tension and resolution. Tension and resolution, of course, are not absolute things. I feel a certain interplay of tension and resolution while listening to, to this piece and also while performing it, but of course I have no guarantee that someone else might experience these tensions and resolutions in a similar manner. I mean, that's, that would be rather, rather arrogant for me to assume, okay, this, these are the tensions and resolutions that I produce, and of course you all experience them in the same way. That doesn't happen. And, and one of the things, one of the elements that is very important in, try, in, 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 in the understanding and experiencing a particular way of music is indeed a cultural background. But I, 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 I do not completely agree with your assertion that when um, free jazz tried to disrupt things that, that kind of, let's say, inhibited affection, I would say that maximized affection in a, in a, in a very fundamental, fundamental way, albeit in a different way than we, for instance, in this improvisation tried to, uh, to accomplish. So affection also in that, um, um, in, um, in that example has a very important role, and especially, let's say, the, the, the clash of cultures almost that is happening there, and people expecting a certain thing and they're hearing another thing, and that class kind of not fitting, and another kind of disruption, which, uh, which I mentioned in our presentation as well, is very effective too. So, and that contributes again to your experience of that performance as well. Okay, time for the last question. Why is Should... sadness negative? Well, that's, that, that's a term that, uh, that, that the Leuze introduced. And I, I agree that the joy and sadness are kind of cliches, like, okay, hey, I'm joyous, so that must be positive, and I'm sad, and that must be negative, and I absolutely agree that sadness might be a very positive affection as well. So it's just one of those labels that Deleuze introduced in order to explain what he's talking about, but I think that sadness can be um, placed under the number of joy in the Deleuze sense, in the sense that that is a positive expansion of feeling as well in many in many cases, especially when it comes to music, of course, we all have we all know examples of musical pieces that are let's say so-called sad, but still, I mean, the, the way they affect us is very positive in a sense. So yeah, so I agree that it's kind of a yeah. It's <coughs> but it has nothing to do with the external, external rise, uh, 
No. Yes, it's, it's the, the fact of the repetition is with the, the uh, intensive feeling. Yeah. Intensive feeling is very strong in sadness. Yeah. And the melancholic uh, mm -hmm. feelings are very integrated by it. Yeah. So it's not a binary. No, 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 no. At all. No, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, there was a very last question. I mean, <laughs> myself, but I think it's very interesting to investigate um, um, the roles and the effective roles that the individual members of an orchestra, for instance, um, uh, uh, play, literally and metaphorically, and, 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 and investigate how that plays out in the sounding music. Is it indeed necessary for, um, uh, for musicians and members of an orchestra to indeed to be, um, uh, let's say, submitted to the, uh, uh, to the conductor and not have this positive expansion of, um, of feeling heaven within themselves. And of course, I think the first question is, is that the case? Do they feel indeed kind of uh, negative in this sense because they are not allowed to somehow express themselves in a way that they feel is necessary for the music? In other words, is the conductor's conduct so disruptive that they cannot experience this positive expansion anymore? That's the first thing that we should Need, that, that you should need to research in order to answer that, that question. And secondly, whether or not either of the two feelings that members of, of an orchestra might have leads to a performance that is either good or bad in whichever sense of the word. In other words, does it have an audible or a noticeable effect on the way they play a piece? I think it's a very interesting, interesting area of study. It's a very complicated one as well, as I think. But very interesting, nonetheless. I think, unfortunately, we have to close. Thank you so much for your music representation. Thank you.